before me, Lord.
there's no way to measure what your word noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he could drink. But the rest said, wait, let's see whether Elijah comes to save him. Then Jesus shouted again, and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two. From top to bottom, the earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. The Roman officer and the other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. And they said, this man truly was the son of God. There were some miracles that took place at the cross. There is a miracle at the cross through Christ. Everything comes through Jesus. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, everything comes through Jesus. So the miracle of the cross and, and the scriptures that we read this morning, there are some things that are kind of intriguing. There is the miracle of darkness. When the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. Now, darkness came around noon, and it went away about three. This was not an eclipse. This was darkness. It could very well have been very similar to the darkness that Pharaoh and the Egyptians felt when darkness came as a plague on them. Jesus was on the cross for six hours. The first three belonged to the crowd. They mocked him. They yelled at him. They were having a great time making sure that this man was dying, who they say blasphemed God because he said he was the son of God. The first three belonged to the crowd. The second... The last three belong to God. The darkness very well could have been the preview to hell. 
It's mentioned a couple other times, the darkness. Well, in 2 Peter 2, 4, it says, For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell in gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. Then Jude, the brother of Jesus, writes in his little book, and I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority. God gave them but left the place where they belonged. God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness. So this... In the sixth hour, when the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole earth until the ninth hour. I don't know if you've ever been to Carlsbad Caverns. You guys have? My wife and I did. We did. We took a bunch of teens from Lubbock first when we worked there. Carlsbad Caverns is an interesting place, isn't it? Well, yeah, duh, yeah. They do have lights in it, but they turn the lights out, you know, when they finally get down to the depths of, you know, where molten lava is. No, it doesn't go that deep. But uh, They turn all the lights out, and you can't even see the hand in front of your face. But this darkness is different. This wasn't the absence of light. This was the absence of life. Jesus died. And what rolled over Mount Calvary or, or you know, wherever you want to call it, the, the, the skull, the, 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 the Golgotha, the, the, the place of the skull, you know, what, however, wherever it was, there was a darkness, almost a darkness of judgment over that whole crowd. Even, it even says that the, that the Roman officer, the centurion, and all the other soldiers were moved by all that took place, but particularly by the darkness. No eclipse. Eclipses don't last that long. The darkness, the darkness was eerie, providing, providing a continuous quietness. Similar to the picture, except there was no light coming through. This was a supernatural darkness. In, in a very similar manner, there are a lot of people living with this darkness in their own life, but it isn't anything that God has done. It is what they have done through the sins of their own life. The darkness of, of not understanding who Jesus is, not knowing Jesus. They may know his name, but there is nothing of life in their lives. It is dark. It is eerily dark, and it would be a darkness that if they hadn't, if, if they never see anything else in the world, the darkness would be, would be what they could expect when they finally die and are separated from Christ for eternity in pits of darkness. Maybe the only thing anybody heard were the moans of those who were on the cross with Jesus. Only the words that Jesus would speak on the cross as he's dying. In a way, this darkness smothered them and had complete covering over them. The miracle of darkness. There's also the miracle of the veil. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, it is finished, and his head fell, and his life 
passed away. Before all of the eyes that were watching him, there were eyes in the temple. Activity was going on. They were getting ready for Passover. Before their startled eyes, those who worked in the temple area, particularly near the most holiest of places, this big, huge, thick curtain was torn in two. I think it's very unusual that that curtain was even there to begin with. There was nothing behind it. There was supposed to be something. There was supposed to be the, the Ark of the Covenant. There was supposed to be really the throne of God, a symbolism of his throne, but there was nothing behind it. It had been lost for many, many, many years. But they, had, they still kept it hidden. And when Jesus died... God finally said, it's time for everything to be open to me. It's time for people to see that the only way they can come to me is through the son who died for them. Not even the Ark of the Covenant was could even have the power to do what Jesus did. God was removing himself from his earthly temple. And as of that moment, the law of Moses was gone. That's better said, the law of Moses had been fulfilled through Jesus. And at that very moment, the priesthood was gone. No wonder many priests later obeyed the gospel. There was no reason for a high priest because the high priest of all the ages actually went through what was necessary for our sins to be forgiven. No longer would there be goats or sheep for Jesus was the one who gave himself for all the things we've ever done wrong, all of our sins. Third, there was the earthquake, the miracle of the earthquake. The earthquake, the earth quaked and the rocks were split. The earth shook beneath the cross because when Jesus died, there was no moment, just like there's no moment when a person dies immediately, they find themselves either in the presence of Jesus or in a dark pit where there's no presence of anything or anyone. When Jesus died, It's the Apostles' Creed that says he immediately went to hell. Why did Jesus immediately go to hell when he died? Because he is life and he is light. And it was time because he paid for the sins of all those who believed in him before. He freed them from death's snare. And as he would the next three days arise from the dead, he would also bring those who were, who were dead in their faith in him, all those who believed in Jesus, they would be released from that place of the dead because Jesus now had a place for them to go. Just as he, just as he told the, the one who died next to him, when, when that man turned to Jesus and said, will you remember, we, remember me when, we, when you get to your kingdom? Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And it was for those who had all died before Jesus. And so when Jesus died, he found himself immediately freeing those people who had died all those millennia before the curse of death had been paid for. 
And all those people who were believers, who acknowledged who God was, who followed him, maybe they didn't know who Jesus was at the time, but when Jesus found himself there where the place of the dead was, his body may have been dead, but Jesus was still alive. And he raised those people from from their dead. And they were told to wait until he arose from the grave because Jesus would be the firstborn of the resurrected. What the law couldn't do, Jesus did for us when he died in our place, paying the debt that we owed, but that we couldn't pay. There's also another miracle. This is the fourth miracle. This is the miracle of the centurion. Again, we have another centurion. Last week we had a centurion. When the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they were terrified and said, truly, this was the Son of God. This may very well be the biggest miracle that Jesus had while he was on the cross. In fact, it is the opening door of the greatest miracle of all that we'll talk about in just a moment. In Mark 15, 39, it tells, he tells us that, that he stood, this centurion stood facing Jesus and saw how Jesus had died. All of that must have made a huge impression on on this man. Finally, he felt the earthquake, the splitting the rocks in two that led to his amazing statement in Mark where he says, truly, this man was the Son of God. Changed life. Two changed lives at the cross. One of the robbers... And one centurion. And who knows how many others were changed at the cross. But now, let's move to the miracle on the cross. See, miracles at the cross are one thing, but the miracle on the cross is what's really important this morning. The miracle on the cross is that Christ died for the sins of all of us. See, the cross is all about Jesus. It's not about us. It's about what Jesus did in order for you and for me to be able to come to God, for us to know that God really loves us. The purpose of bringing us to God implies that prior to Jesus dying, we were far away. And that's why the Apostle Paul wrote that it's the blood of Jesus who draws us near. But he would also, Paul would also write in 2 Corinthians, the the fifth chapter, the 21st verse. God was in Christ reconciling reconciling the world to himself. It was God's willingness to give his son. Like the story of Abraham and Isaac. And as Isaac was being put on that altar and Abraham was ready to sacrifice his son because he believed that's what God told him to do, God said, no, you can't do that. And if God could have spoken more to Abraham, I think he would have said, because that will be fulfilled years from now. I don't want any man or woman to pay the price that I had to pay. But I willingly pay that price in order for you to know that I love you. And Jesus was the person who gave that message to us. Does he love you? Of course he does. Why do bad things happen in this world? Those bad things happen not because of God. Those bad things happen because of sin, because of our own self-centeredness and our selfishness, and we could just go the gamut. But... Jesus is not a part of that. Jesus is a part of trying to let you know that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit loves you with all that he has. Our sin needed to be dealt with. 
in order for us to know God the Father, for us to know personally Jesus Christ into our lives. So, the miracle on the cross was filled with not of anything of a physical nature except the body and the blood. But when that body died, Jesus didn't. Jesus lived to set free people who would believe in him and experience the transformation that only Jesus can make in each one of our lives. The power is not in the physical. The power is in the spirit of Jesus who comes into our lives in our, with our faith in Jesus asking him to forgive us. And our lives are transformed and changed in a moment when that is done as we confess to him, as we pour out our hearts to him, all those things we've ever done wrong. You say, well, you know, it's okay because I, I, he'll forgive me anyway. He just died on the cross. Everybody is saved once they believe. I want to tell you, folks, that's just not true. We are saved when we confess our sins. And if you live in this cycle of always having to confess because you're always sinning, I'm telling you, you don't know the joy of the salvation and the freedom that Jesus gives if you still are stuck in it. Can we pray? Lord Jesus, by your love and by your grace, we have acknowledged you as our Lord and Savior again this morning. We worship you. We don't forget what you did for us. We don't for forget the miracles that took place that were supernatural from that cross. And we do not forget what that cross means to the Father and what that cross meant to you and what that cross means to us. And so in the ugliness of it, there is also a beauty about it that our lives are transformed by your, by your price that you paid for, by the blood that you shed, by giving yourself for us and all the things that we've ever done wrong, you have forgiven us. We give you praise. We give you glory. We leave this place in the power of your presence. In the name of Jesus and God's people said, Amen.